welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Our text today is going to come out of the book of Numbers. Numbers. It's just good to laugh with the Lord. I love the joy of the Lord is our strength. Numbers, the 13th chapter, will be our main text, but we're going to start in the in the book of Luke. I'm going to give you Luke, the 6th chapter, verse 32, and uh, a couple things that are on our heart. If we title this message, it would be walking in the blessings of God no, or in the promise. Possessing the promise. Possessing the promise Stick of with God. with the title, Possessing the Promise. I know you couldn't remember it because you were thinking about your foot, but possessing the promise. It's going to be a long (laughs) service, isn't it? (laughs) Or having hope in a hopeless situation. See, I can throw that out too. Whatever works for you, possessing the promise if you're taking notes. You have to get in position to receive the blessings from God. God has a, a blessing for you, but we have to get ourselves positioned to receive the blessing. That's one of the reasons Amen. you come to church. You come to church because you're going to get blessed today. Amen. If you haven't already been blessed by the music, the Lord can speak to you today, and that's a blessing in your life. You Amen. can leave here with a word to change someone else's life. But it says here in the book of Luke, the sixth chapter, verse 32, it says, if you merely love those who love you, what quality or credit... And thanks is it to you, for even the very sinners love their lovers, those who love them. Mm -hmm. Now, it's easy to love my wife. She is, uh, huh? Well. (laughs) Well, she's bubbly. She's exuberant. She has a smile on her face. She has talk to me written all over her. So it's easy to walk up or approach her and, and love her because she's lovely. But the Bible also says here. That's no benefit. I mean, it's, it's, it's no benefit to you to love people that are easy to love. But it says, but love, verse 35, but love your enemies and be mm. kind and do good favors so that someone derives benefit from them. Mm-hmm. And then expecting and hoping for nothing in return, considering nothing lost. For in that. You will have a reward, the rest of the scripture says, because God says, if you'll love those that are hard to love, I'm going to reward you for that. God is always looking for opportunities to bless you. He's looking for opportunities to reward you. He's not a God who's mad at you. He's a God who loves you. He's your daddy God that says, hey, you did something nice. I'm going to bless you for that. Oh, you were sweet there. I'm going to bless you for that. He longs to bless us. And I started to think about that yesterday when we came in and we saw this up here where it says Mm -hmm. how many people you fed and how many bus rides that you've given and how many people have graduated from the school of ministry. You have done something for people that Mm -hmm. you don't even know. You positioned yourself for a blessing Blessing. because you participate in it. See, when we drove up today, someone was directing in the parking lot. There's a blessing. Absolutely. He put himself in line for a blessing when someone opened the back door. Or even to the fact you say, well... To, to get a blessing, I must do something huge. Well, you know, God longs to reward you. So, f- of course, if, you know, we think, oh, if I give my car away, God will bless me. Well, I'm not saying he won't. He will bless you if you give your car away. But he loves you so much, he's looking for you just to love people that are hard to love. I mean, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said they will know us when we love one another. It's all about our love for each other, loving those that are easy to love and loving those that are hard to love. And that doesn't mean being different than you are. I mean, you you will learn as you get older. I mean, I'm 55 years old. I've been in menopause for 13 years. I learned very quickly (laughs) who I am. And menopause is a great place to be, ladies. I mean, just embrace it because you quit caring what people think. It's an awesome (laughs) place to be. And all you do is care about what God thinks. It's awesome. Men, don't let her kid you. (laughs) I'm hot. I'm cold. I'm hot. I'm cold. No. (laughs) Turn your Bibles, if you have it, to Mark, the ninth chapter, verse 41. So to position yourself for a blessing, the Lord notices everything Everything. that we do. Everything. And here it says in verse 41 in, in the book of Mark, it says, For I tell you truly, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink... Because you belong to and bear the name of Christ, but by will no means fail to get his reward. So just a bottle of water, whoever brought this bottle of water and said it right there, is already in line for a blessing. That's how much God wants to bless you. You see, if we don't think right, we'll not be right. Because Proverbs 23, 7 says, as you think in your heart, you are. So whatever you're thinking today, you're living tomorrow. 
Whatever you allow your mind to think today, you're living tomorrow. We need to think who our God is. He longs to bless us. He blesses us by a bottle of water. Here, have a bottle of water. There you go. I'm being blessed now. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, this is a visual illustration I want you to know because she, I don't even go there. She hit me with it in the first service. Hey, like, <laughs> you were smarter this time. You caught it. <laughs> you threw it at my head. I didn't say I was a good throw. This bottle of water someone placed here today, that's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Someone who went to the store and got the bottle of water, They're also that's getting a, blessing. a blessing. The person who gave in the offering that They're purchased this bottle of water had positioned themselves for a blessing. See, you don't even remember the things that you have done, but God says, I notice even yes. the little thing Bless. that you did, even yes. as small as a drink yes. of water. And he says, I have a blessing for you on the shelf, but you need to get in line to receive the blessing. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to bless my wife back with Thank this you. bottle of water. I receive it. Now, don't you hit me in the head with it this time. <laughs> but if she's going to bless me bless back and I water. turn to you... <laughs> But did the blessing come? I was blessing him with the water, but he missed it because he took his eyes off the one giving him the blessing. See, when you put your eyes on man or when you put your eyes on your paycheck or you put your eyes on your boss and you say, that's the person blessing me, you've already missed the boat because God is the one who blesses you. See, we want to give you a message of hope today, and hope came in the form of a child this season. Jesus came as hope to the world. You see, when everything out there says it's hopeless, God says, I sent my son because there's always hope. Mm -hmm. And there's hope for you. See, so you say, well, I'm unemployed. No, you're not. With God, all things are possible. You're employable. You're not just employable. So you employable. need to change the way that you're thinking. And one of the stories that... that, that you're not just employable. You're the most employable. Because when God lives inside of you, they're also hiring the Spirit of God inside of you. So you go in, and their business is blessed merely because you're there. Well, but I don't have the right clothes, or I don't have the right education. But you have God. You don't need But clothes. someone else is more qualified than me. It doesn't matter about qualifications. The Spirit of God, all things are possible to him who believes. So what do you see when you look in the mirror every morning? You see, I was created in God's image. You were created in God's image. So when you look in the mirror, you should see a mirror reflection of God. And you say, well, does God look like that? He is a mirror reflection of you because you have his DNA in your body. You, you have the lineage of Christ him. inside of you. See, we want to think about the fact that, well, um, you know, but you don't know my background. Like my father left when I was two years old. I don't even know who my father was. And my mother, she, she, was, a, she was a heroin addict. Listen, you don't know my background. My, and my grandfather that I was told about was an abuser. So how could God? Listen, huh. you didn't come from your parents. You came through your parents. Mm -hmm. You came, came from the from throne room of God. You have royal blood running through your veins. Your father Full circle. has the cattle on a thousand hills. You need to understand who your father is. Now, I want you to turn your Bible to the book of Numbers, the 13th chapter. You, you made me think about that our friend, uh, Aaron, who got uh, well, his job opportunity. He didn't have a job, couldn't get a job, but all of a sudden God opened the door. The scripture says, so is a man. Thinks in his heart, so is he. We want to change your thinking a little bit this morning. You ready? A friend of ours, who Cheryl just mentioned, um, was unemployed. And he, we've known his family for a number of years, and he's, he's a young man, and he got a job. He got a job doing landscaping. And so on Monday morning, he got up to go to work, and he goes out to his truck, which he needs his truck to do the job, and he goes out front, and the truck has a flat tire. So he says, I can't get to work if I don't have a, my, my tire. So he, so he went inside, and he got the tire pump, and he pumped it up enough to get down to the corner tire shop. And he went inside, and he said, I've had a flat tire. Maybe I have a nail or something wrong with my tire. And the man took a look at it. He said, I'm sorry. You can put air in it all day long. It's going to come out because it's down to the cord. The tire's ruined, and you need a new tire. And he said, well, how much is that? And he said, it's $100. He said, well, I'm unemployed, and I need my truck to get to work, and I don't have $100. If I can't get the tire, I can't get to work. And if I can't get to work, I can't earn enough money to get the tire. Do you understand how this thing works? 
And so the man said, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. He said, but not only is your one tire bad, but all four of the tires are in the same shape. He said, you really need four tires and $400. And the young man said, I don't have it. And so he went outside and he was sitting on the curb next to his truck, dejected, saying, if I can't get to work, I can't earn the money, I can't get the tire, I can't get the... About that time, this woman in a white Cadillac drives up right beside his car. She rolled down her window. She said, son, what you sitting there looking so bad? What's wrong with you? And the young man told her the story. He said, I'm supposed to start my new job, and I've got a flat tire, and, and I need new tires. And, and, and You're she's, sitting in front of the tire store. Go in there and buy your tires. And he said, I don't have the $400 Oh, to buy okay. The tire. She said, well, I'll be right back. So she rolls up her window. She drives off. He doesn't know her. He doesn't know if she's coming back. But she said, I'll be right back. So she's about 20 minutes before she comes back. He's still sitting there on the curb. She comes back 20 minutes later. She drives right up beside him. She rolls down her window. She says, here, one, two, three, four hundred dollars. Don't forget, God wants to bless you. Rolls up her window and drives off. That's a true story. Just happened. Now, I know what you're thinking. Maybe if I find that tire store and sit out in the parking lot, someone will give me $400. No, no, no. I want to be the woman in the white Cadillac. I want to be the one that has more than enough looking for somebody to bless. As you think you are. Okay, so you're ready to, to get the blessing here. In verse uh, 1, chapter 13, the book of Numbers reads like this. And the Lord said to Moses... And I think that's interesting because Pastor Jim said, don't listen for Harry and Cheryl's word, listen, listen to, the Lord. to the Lord. So here's the word of the Lord today. He says to Moses, I want you to send men out and explore or scout out for yourselves the land of Canaan, which I give to the Israelites from each tribe of their fathers used to send a man and everyone a leader or a head among them. Mm -hmm. So a, Moses, by the word of the Lord, sent scouts out from the wilderness of Paran, all of them men who were heads of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. That's a present tense verb, which I give. God is always right now. We tend to think, maybe I miss God. He, he came last week and I missed him. Or, or, God, hurry up. I need you to be here. Well, you might come next week. I need you today. Listen, he's given right now. Today is your day of salvation. Today is your day of breakthrough. Today is your day of victory. Don't look yesterday. Don't look next week. Today is your day. Verse 17 picks it up because he names all the, the men, but he says in verse 17, So Moses sent them out to scout out the land of Canaan. And he said to them, Get up this way by the south and go into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell there are strong or weak, few or many, and whether the land in which they live in is good or bad or whether the cities they dwell in are camps or strongholds. Mm -hmm. And what the land is, whether it's fat or lean, and whether there's timber on it or not. First thing he said was go in and look around in Canaan. In Canaan there, it's the promise. It's the promised land. God promised the Israelites, I'm going to give you the promised land. So when you see Canaan, he's saying, I'm giving you the promise. I don't know what it is you need, but God has a promise for you. And whatever it is you need, he's a yes and an amen God. And he's here today to bring to you what you need to move on. And he says to these men, I have this for you. I'm giving it to you. I want you to go in there and look around and see what the land is. Now, the reason he said that was because we know now in the New Testament, we walk by and not by. He said, I want you to go in there because life is filled with things that you're going to be seeing. And the things that you see, if you don't walk by faith, the things that you see will keep you from possessing the promise. But I want to teach you that even though you have natural eyes and you're looking at horrible circumstances and you're looking at awful situations, I'm still the God of the promise. I will bring you through to victory. He's not going to be too challenging to him. He said, see whether the people who dwell there are strong or weak or if there's a lot of them or not, few or many. And see what they land in is good or bad. And the city, see if their camps or strongholds. Are there tents or are there buildings? A report. He's asking for a report, not an opinion. And see if there's a tree on it or not. Can you see a tree? And then he changes. He goes here in the next verse, in verse 20. He says, and now be of good courage. Uh, now he's dealing with their being. You see, so many times we, we think life's about our doing. But God deals with your being. He says, be saved, not do saved. Be healed, not do healed. Be holy, be righteous. See, he's all about your being. And here he says, if you're going to go in and take the promise that I have given you, your being has to be infiltrated with my courage because I'm never going to ask you to do something that I don't equip you to do. So he said, here, 
courage, that's what you're going to need. Or in the midst of your blessing or the promise of God, there's going to be some obstacles mm. that you're going to need to overcome, mm. and you're going to need the strength from the Lord or the courage of the Lord to get through this situation. Mm -hmm. Now, he always equips you to get to the other side. So he says, here, have some courage, take a look around, and then he says, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Mm -hmm. Now was the time of the first ripe grape. He never sets us up to fail. He sets us up to succeed. See, he said, it's harvest time. Go in now. So I'm sending you in at harvest time because you're set up to succeed from God, not to fail by God. So he says, bring some of the fruit out. Now let's pick it up for time and go on. He says, so they go up and they scout out the land from the wilderness of Zin, Rahab, and the entrance of Hamath. They go up to the south, and they came to Hebron, Aham, and Sashai, and Talmai. Probably the three tribes of the sons of Anak were there. Everybody say giants. That's what they're talking about, giants in the land. And they came to the valley of Eshal, and they cut down from there a branch with a cluster of grapes on it. And they carried it on a pole between the two of them. They brought also some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshaw, or Cluster, because of the cluster which the Israelites cut from there. And they returned from scouting out the land after 40 days. Say 40 days. 40 days. That's a month and a half. That's six weeks. So get that in your mind. They didn't run in there and run out. 40 days. Now, now keep that. Store that back there. It's important later on. And they came to Moses and Aaron to all the Israelite congregation in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, and they brought them a word. And they showed them the fruit. And they said to Moses, we came to the land in which you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and here is the proof or the fruit. Right. Now, these three fruits are very important. Number one, grapes. He was using the three fruits as a sign to the nation. You see, we, God's people, we're assigned to this nation that we are still a Christian nation, that we are one nation under God, that we, in God, we trust. We are a Christian nation. I don't care what anybody else says. We are a Christian nation. I prophesy it in Jesus' name. We're a Christian nation. He was using these three fruits from the promised land. You got 12 spies or leaders of the entire nation. And he said, you leadership you're going to show the nation what my promise is all about. So he says, bring three things out to prove to them that I am who I say I am. First thing he said was he said, bring grapes, because grapes always represent the blessing. I'm a blessing God. I'm not cursing you. I'm blessing you. I want to bless you. So he said, bring the grapes. And when you take grapes and you cut them off of the... Oh, so in the middle of the promise... There was a vine that had grapes growing on it. What Jesus said in the book of John, I am the So right in the middle of every promise from God, you're going to find your Savior. You're going to find your Jesus. He's always going to be right there. Now, take that in, in, in context. It says, now cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. One cluster. And they carried it on the pole between the two of them. Wow. Now, I do the shopping in our home. I've done it for 27 years. Because I don't like what she buys. I like what I like to eat. Fat, food, fat free doesn't work in my home. Just feed me the cardboard box. It tastes the same. So I do the shopping. And I go to Costco. I go to Sam's. And I go to Stater Brothers. Now, if I was to go into Stater Brothers and I was to buy a cluster of grapes, they would fit in the palm of my hand, wouldn't they? But here it says, and they cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they had to carry it on a pole between the two of them. How big was the cluster of grapes that they cut from there? The, the size, size of a basketball. basketball. Which means the cluster then, if you've got basketball grapes, one cluster of grapes had to be like the size of humanity, a, a human being. Because if you're carrying it on a pole between two men and it's going to hang to the ground. I mean, if you put a cluster of grapes this tall on a pole between, I mean, people would say, what is wrong with you? So this is a cluster of grapes the size of a human being, which is who we are. We are the blessing to the nation. We bring the blessing of God when we walk in the blessing of God. But it's more than that. God uses everything in his word as a sign to us. And here he was using the blessing as a sign to the nation. But think about this also, and, and, and I want to throw that out. Imagine if I ask one of you to come into the grocery store with me. If I said, come to the grocery store with me because I want to carry out a cluster of grapes. <laughs> and I need you to come in and help me carry out the cluster of grapes on a pole. Why? Because the grapes are the size of basketballs. 
You'd say, what have you been smoking? <laughs> because grapes fit in the palm of your hand. Remember, he Not said, go God. and look around. Because you're going to have to bring out the blessing because when I bless you, people won't even be able to believe it because they've got to see it to believe it. Listen, you'll never see it if you don't believe it. But if you believe it, you can see it. Bring out the proof of the blessing of God. And they put the blessing on a pole between two human beings and they walk out. They walk out of the middle of the promise and back into the nation with all this big one cluster of grapes the size of humanity. What was he trying to give them a, a, a future vision of? You got the blessing of God hung between two men. Obviously, this is a prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus hung on a cross between two thieves. He's always given us signs. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. Hold on. I'm coming. Now, think about this. The Bible also says that I will pour you out a blessing where you don't even have room enough to, room enough to receive it. So the blessing is always so big bigger. that you can't carry it out yourself. Takes you are going to have to call on somebody else because the blessing, like the bottle of water, more continues. Than you. More than you. Okay. Then he says, get figs. Figs my represent abundance. I love figs. It's my favorite fruit because it, it represents the, the massiveness of who God really is. I grew up in the South. We can grow figs in the South. And it's the only tree that fruits first. I don't know if you knew that, but it puts out the fig, and then it'll put out the leaf. And then it'll put out fruit over and over. That's where we get the term first fruit. It fruits first, and then it puts out the leaves. That's why in, in Mark 11, when Jesus saw a fig tree afar off. The Bible said he was hungry. And he saw the fig tree. So he goes over to the fig tree because he's hungry. And he starts looking through the leaves and he finds no fruit. And some people would say, oh, Jesus cursed the tree. He did not curse the tree. He merely sealed it in the condition he found it. He said, let no man eat fruit of you ever again. He didn't curse the tree. He just sealed it the way he found it. How many of you want God to seal you the way he finds you today? If he's looking around in your leaves, are you fruitful? Yes, seal me in fruitfulness, Lord. Are you without fruit? God, give us another chance. Don't seal me in the condition of fruitlessness. So then he goes from the abundance of figs to the blessing of grapes to the pomegranate. Would you love pomegranate? Pomegranates. Do you like pomegranates? Someone blessed me with four pomegranates today. <laughs> and back there, they're the size of my hand. Have you ever opened a pomegranate? There are seeds in it, aren't they? What color are they? Red. Have you ever gotten it on your fingers? It stains it, doesn't it? Back in the day when Alexander the Great tried to come and conquer the world, he spared some of the Lebanese people. I know that because I'm Lebanese. He spared them because they would take pomegranates, break them apart, crush them, and make a dye, and they would dye the robes of the royal families. Mm. So here is another sign from God. So he said, I'm blessing you. I am more than enough. But more than that, it's not all about who I am. You need to know who you are. You see, if you don't know who you are, you won't walk in all that God has for you. He said, take the blood of the pomegranate. Now, see, they had been delivered out of Egypt, and they did that by putting the blood on the doorpost. So it's a familiar, recent thing in their mind to know what the blood does. So he says, take the pomegranate and mark yourself so you don't forget who you are. See, if you don't know you're a king's kid, you won't walk like it. If you don't know you're a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, you won't act like it. God says, mark yourself. So many times I think people think that they had to mark themselves for the giants. But the giants already knew who they were. The heathen knew who they were. They were in there for 40 days. The giant didn't threaten them. The giant didn't say, put my grapes back. The giants didn't do anything. The giants just let them live in the promise because the giants knew who they were. Listen, this is the thing you've got to understand. The devil, when you belong to God, the devil knows you belong to God. He just hopes you never figure it out. So let's finish this up. Verse 28. But the people who dwell there are strong. And the cities are fortified, and they're very large. Moreover, we saw the sons of Anak, or the giants. Amalek dwells in the land of the south. The Hittite, the Jebusite, the Amorite dwell in the hill country. The Canaanite dwells by the sea and along the side of the Jordan River. Caleb says, 
Shut up. Be quiet. Don't talk like that. Don't speak horrible things. Don't start opinionating. God asked for a report, not an opinion. The minute they said, but, they started giving their opinion. So he says, let's go up at once and possess it, for we are able to conquer it. We are able. But the fellow scout said, we are not able to go up against the people of Canaan, for they're stronger than we are. So they brought the Israelites an evil report of the land in which they'd scouted it out, saying, the land, though we went to spy it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw there are men of great stature. There we saw Nephilim, or the giants, the sons of Anak, who come from the giants. And so, therefore, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and therefore, we were in their sight. How do you see yourself? When you see yourself like a grasshopper, the giant sees you like a grasshopper. When no. you see yourself as a king's kid, the giant sees you as a king's kid. Number one, they failed because they didn't believe. They took a, look, took a look around. Now, how many days were in there? How many nights? They ate in the promise. They slept in the promise. They drank in the promise. And they brought the promise out. But they still didn't believe. Now, two of them says, we can have the promise of God. Let's go take it. But Let's the rest of them it. said, we cannot have the promise of God because they are stronger than we are. Your first step to failure is when you compare yourself to somebody else. God said, I am created, I create you in my. my image. Listen, don't compare yourself to somebody on your left or your right. You compare yourself to your heavenly father. I wake up every morning, look in the mirror, and I say, you good-looking thing, don't you ever die. <laughs> I'm created in his image. Amen. I know who I am in Christ, but 40 days they were in there. 40 nights, they bring out the promise. But they spoke evil of the promise. That's the problem. Not only did they speak evil of it, they said it devours its inhabitants. Who was devoured? Was anybody devoured? Did the 12 spies that went in, did those 12 spies come out? Who got devoured? You know what they did? They lied. That whole Bible is, is the truth of God. But in it, that one thing is a lie. Those people lied about God's promise. There will be people in your life who try to tell you God is not who he says he is. There will be people who try to tell you God's not a good God. I'm here to tell you that the word of God is true. Every bit of who he says he is, he is. He is a healer. He's a deliverer. He's a way maker. He's a true God, and he loves you. There will be people telling you you can't, you won't, you shouldn't, you couldn't because of where you came from. But you're going to have to tell them, I didn't come from my earthly parents. I came from my heavenly father. And I have royal blood running through my veins. So therefore, I have positioned myself to receive the blessing of God. I do not compare myself to the giants. I compare the giants to my God. And there's no comparison. Now, we're going to close with this. Hope came in the form of a child. And that's what we are supposed to remember this upcoming holiday season. For God so loved the world that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. Even Abraham Lincoln said, we give hope to the world and not despair. He acknowledged the fact that hope is what we need to hold on to until our faith kicks in. Have faith in God because you have hope. And it came in the form of a child. So what do you do this holiday season? Maybe it's at your own Thanksgiving table. You have someone that comes to your house that they're not easy to love. Love them But anyway. you love them anyways. What do you do? You put down a meal. You might bring them a glass of water. You might tell them God loves you. But you do it as a favor unto the Lord. And now you've positioned yourself for a blessing from God. Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss you, we just want to spend a moment talking to you about your eternity. You know, the whole story we talked about today, it, it was so simple. They just had one decision to make, just believe God. And they were the leaders, and 10 out of 12 still didn't believe. And because of that one choice they made, not only did it cost them 40 years, but those 10 never got to go into the promise because they made the wrong choice. And even their wrong choice cost those around them 40 years before they could go in.
God puts choices before us every day, and we make them. No one can choose for me. I choose for me. I, I have a right. I have a right to choose. I can go to hell if I want to. I can go to heaven if I want to. That's a choice I get to make. But the fact is, the Bible is so plain. You know, I grew up in the South, and everybody went to church. But churches were filled with people still going to hell. They went to church, but they were going to hell because they didn't know who Jesus really is in their life. They didn't understand that he needs to know us. He, he doesn't want to just um, be religious with us. He wants us to know him intimately. He wants to be with us all day long, every day, be in fellowship with us, helping us, guiding us, directing us. That we have a choice. We can choose to let him in. It's my choice. And I, I just want to say, you have the same choice that I do. God loves us all the same. He's knocking on the door of our heart right now and if you don't know him in that way you say well I know who Jesus is but you know every, demons in hell know who Jesus is I mean that's like saying I know the president I know where he lives I know his address I know how to get in touch with him if I have to but see knowing God like that is not enough he has to know us in Matthew 25 the ten virgins were all ready they were waiting while they waited they went to sleep they heard the bridegroom is coming. They all woke up. They all trimmed their lamps. Only five had enough oil. The other five didn't have enough oil. They go away. They buy oil. They come back. But while they're gone, the bridegroom comes and he takes them and he shuts the door. And I can just see our Savior leaning up against that door so sad that he had to leave those five. But they had a choice. And they didn't make the right one. And so they come running back and they're knocking on the door. Open the door. Open the door. We have enough oil now. We're ready. It's amazing to me in that scripture, Matthew 25. Jesus doesn't say, you don't know me. He said, I don't know you. You see, it's not enough that you know his name. He needs to know your name. That's the intimacy that we have with our Savior. 44 years ago, my father went to heaven. He was 43 years of age. And he was diagnosed with a terminal illness. And within six months, he went home to be with the Lord. And I'll never forget a week before he went home to be with the Lord, a man called him on the telephone. And he said, I understand the state that your body, your physical body is in. He said, I'm not calling you to ask you about your physical body because we still pray, we believe, and we stand on the word of God that you can be healed. But should God not choose to heal you on this side and you go home, will you be ready to meet your eternal father? And my dad said, well, you know, the priest has come in. He said, no, no, I'm not talking about a man that has prayed over you. I'm talking about your heart. He said, well, you know, I attend church. And he said, no, no, I'm not talking about you going to church. And he said, well, you know, I grew up as an altar boy. He said, no, no, I'm not talking about when you were a child. He said, I'm talking about the choice you make as a man right now. And my father at that moment prayed the prayer with that man on the phone. So now, 44 years later, I don't have to hope my dad's in heaven. I don't have to think he's in heaven. I don't believe he's in heaven. I know he's in heaven. Because someone took the time to present Jesus Christ to him. And as Cheryl said, you know, it's a religious thing. I worked in a major ministry for 15 years of my life, but it wasn't until one night I sat down on the sofa and I had a personal encounter with my Savior, Jesus Christ. I had an intimate relationship with the one that was waiting for me and is still waiting for me on that eternal day you were uncertain of your eternal destiny, God is knocking on the door of your heart. You don't have to be uncertain anymore. If you're saying, I want to give my heart to Jesus, this is the time, this is the moment. You have the right to make a choice now to walk right straight into the promised land and not miss a moment, not a moment of your future with God.
If you are ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, right now, without a hesitation, without a thought, without an intimidation, without any fear, just say, right now, I'm giving my life to Jesus. And just shoot your hand up in the air right now. Just shoot it up. I'm giving my heart to Jesus. Thank you. I'm giving my heart to Jesus. Just lift up your hand. I want to give my heart to Jesus. Maybe you say, I've been away from God, but I want to come back home to God. I need to know that I'm walking with him every day. If that's you, just lift your hand. Just lift it up all over. Lift your hand up and say, my life is yours, Jesus. I don't want to be walking the wrong way anymore. I want to be walking the right way. Just lift it up right now all over the house. Listen, don't be intimidated. Don't let fear keep you from your eternal destiny. Jesus has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your life. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Here's my hand, God. It represents my future. It represents my future. And I choose to receive Jesus. And you can't be concerned about what the person on your left or your right is going to think about you because they've sat in the same seat that you're sitting in right now. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but we all were bold enough to one day make that statement that said, I don't want to be the old person. I want to be a new person. And the only way to do that is through my Savior, Jesus Christ, because his blood can wash away all my sins. You see, we start to think about what other people think. I want you to know something. You better stop worrying about what other people think, and you better be concerned about what God knows Who about you. Because he knows every the little thing. If he God. understands that you could give a Who drink of water, he watches everything that you did last week, last month, last Who year, or even last night. And should you God. leave your body today, would you stand Who face to face with them, and would you have to dip your eyebrow, and you couldn't look him eyeball to eyeball, because you know there's something that would keep you and him apart for eternity, and you couldn't look him in the eye. And make no doubt about it, the Father would look back at you and say, I'm sorry, but you do not have entree into the heavenlies for eternity. You see, you don't want to run that risk, but you can have a guarantee. And that guarantee would be to acknowledge Christ today and say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I've fallen short of the glory of God and I want to get right with you. If you want that in your life, slip your hand up real quick in the house. Anyone else in the Thank house? You. Thank you. Thank now you. I'm going to just ask one other thing. I'm going to ask you. everyone in the house to stand to your feet. Thank and those of you that slipped your hands up, stand to your feet. And if you slipped your hand up for either one of those to rededicate or to dedicate your life, I want you to get out of your seat and come down here to the altar right now. Because I want to greet you just like your Heavenly Father wants to meet you right now. Just we want to right meet here. you. We want to greet you. We want to invite you into the kingdom of heaven. A knowing. A guarantee. Don't wiggle, don't slip, don't move. Come on, be bold and get down here. Every breath that I take, every moment I Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God bless you. God bless you. Lord, I give you my heart. Let's encourage you. Amen. Maybe you're one that's been sitting in your seat and saying, he was talking to me, but now everyone else has gone down there. I'm not as intimidated. Or you might be seated in your seat saying, well, is God interested in me? And was that prayer just for them? No, it's for you. If you've been seated in your chair and you're saying, uh, it's about everyone else. No, I'm talking to you right now. This might be your last opportunity. We do not know what tomorrow will bring. But just like I said with my dad, I can't hope. I can't think, I can't wish. You need to know that if you left this earth absent from the body, you'd be present with the Lord. We'll take an extra 10 seconds. Anyone else in the house? And then we're going to pray. Anyone else in the house? In 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. All right, we're going to pray. Those of you that are standing here, you're going to pray a prayer, and it's called the prayer of dedication. Some people call it the sinner's prayer. And what's going to happen is you're going to pray this prayer, and you're going to change from who you used to be to who God wants you to be. And you might say, well, what do words mean? When Mary said, be it unto me, as the angel has spoken, those words changed her life. She acknowledged what the angel said about her heavenly father. Through an angel said, I'm going to give you a Messiah. She was the first 
to acknowledge He's Christ on this earth. Words can change your life. He's but God, through his son, can change your eternal life. Are you ready to pray? Let's everyone in the house stretch your hands out here. and Let's all pray this out loud and bold. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father today, today we, declare we declare that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord, as Lord of our life. Of our life. Never, to be the same. Never to be the same. I turn loose of my past. I live in the present, I live in the present with, a with a guarantee of my future, of my future through, Christ Jesus. through Christ Jesus. I am now, I am now born, again born again by the shed blood, the shed of, blood Jesus of Jesus Christ. If you believe that with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, we seal it with amen and amen and amen. Turn around. There's someone that wants to talk with you. And are they going to go with you, Dave? If you'd follow Dave this way and you give them an encouragement as they go. Just make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Thank you, Harry. Come on, somebody. Is anybody happy in the house of the Lord? Miracle right before our eyes. God is so good.